Hello once again, my fellow Titanic fans. I'd like to welcome you to another video. And we're doing a special commemorative issue or video for the 111th year anniversary of the sinking of this magnificent ship. Today we're going to be using the Ship Magnificent books as a reference. And I want to talk to you guys about the engine room. Now recently I had done the Agora Models 1200 scale engine room and we put the propellers on most recent but I actually did a demonstration for them for you guys to show you how just amazing the whole system was and it included the turbine. What I want to share with you guys today is some information on the engines themselves. And it's not necessarily called the engine room, it's called the propelling machinery. And let's go to 283. And this would be chapter number 15. The beginning of the 20th century was a prime and rapid evolution of the field of marine engineering. As new technologies developed, they were quickly applied, even if not developed to their full potential. Such is the case with the marine steam turbine. Though the turbine was beginning to show potential for producing considerable power in comparison to its size and weight, it was still many years away from becoming an economical prime mover for merchant shipping. And you can see a little table right there. Comparative fuel consumption, common propulsion systems, and this is from 1912. The engine type, the expansion steam engine, run on coal. Quadruple expansion steam engines, also ran on coal. The direct drive turbine at low speeds, under 16 knots, again was coal. Direct drive turbine at high speeds, which was over 23 knots, again was run on coal. These are all run on coal incidentally. The direct drive turbine at high speeds, over 23 knots, the triple expansion HP, IR, and LP stages. Combination triple expansion engine and exhaust turbines, and of course they all ran on coal. For large high-speed passenger liners which required great horsepower, the turbine was clearly becoming the engine of choice. Ships like Cunard Line's Lusitania and Mauritania required better than 72,000 shaft horsepower to maintain their 25 knot service speed. Power output of this kind was practically only from turbines or multiple lines of shafting. As the size, weight, and reciprocating engines capable of producing such output was prohibitive, however, higher speeds came at commensurately higher prices. In addition to the much greater initial cost of the machinery came much higher fuel consumption, often coupled with the reduced passenger and cargo carrying capacity associated with the full liner hulls required for high-speed operations. As will be seen from the general arrangement plans of the ship as well as the elevations, sections, and plans of the boiler and engine rooms, nearly the entire space beneath the upper deck, or E, was occupied by the, stern, uh, the steam generating plant, the coal bunkers, and propelling machinery. The boiler installation and bunkers occupied six watertight compartments throughout the mid-body of the vessel, over a total length of 320 feet. Let's show you some of the, um, the plans or the schematics. And I think this is for Olympic. The White Star Line Olympic longitude section showing reciprocating and turbine machinery. Again, you can see the, the pistons. White Star Liner Olympic plan showing the general arrangement of the machinery, and this is from a top view. The 
passes the White Star Liner Olympic cross section through the machinery compartments. I wish it would have been Titanic. Boiler rooms inboard profile through number one and number two boiler room. I'll put pictures up so you guys can see it better. The boilers of the White Star Liner Olympic. We got a cross section, the boilers. I love that. And this very much looks like the engine room that we're building from Agora Models. The tank top, Titanic's tank top, showing general arrangements of the boilers, engines, and auxiliaries. You can see the propeller shafts. I love that shot of the boilers. It's pretty iconic. Steam was generated by a plant comprised of 24 double-ended and five single-ended boilers designed for a working pressure of 215 pounds per square inch gauge PSIG. Maintain other normal draft conditions. The aftermost number one boiler room contained five single-ended boilers, while boiler room number two, three, and four, and five each contained five double-ended boilers. The foremost or number six boiler room was contained four double-ended boilers the great breadth of the ship, as well as the absence of longitudinal coal bunkers common in other ships of the time allowed for an arrangement of five boilers abreast, is shown in the general arrangements concept in number six boiler room. And we got another boiler, double-ended scotch boiler end view. These things were massive. Again, I'll put the pictures up so you see them a little bit better. And we're going to show you, see the diagram right there? I'm going to put a picture up and I'm going to show you the table. The boiler connections to the Scotch boiler. Typical connections, A, the automatic safety valves. B, the main stop valve. The C is the auxiliary stop valve when fitted. D is the main feed non-return valve. E is the auxiliary donkey feed from non-return valve. F is the surface blow-off valve. G is the water gauge. H is the water gauge clock. J is the pressure, pressure gauge. K is the pressure gauge clock. L, the bottom blow-off valve, M, the electric engine stop valve when fitted, N is the air valve used when draining or fitting, P is the circulation valve, Q, the salinometer clock for obtaining water samples, R is the scum pan, and S is the drain plug. The furnace fronts. The marine type Scotch boilers in Holland and Wolves Shipyard power plant were outfitted with downy boltless furnace fronts, identical to those installed aboard Titanic. So the boiler data, and let me show you guys the table. So we got the number of boilers. The double-ended boiler, there are 24. Single-sided, there are five. The diameter is 15 feet, nine inches on the double-ended and 15 feet, nine inches on the single-ended. The length, 20 feet long um, and 11 feet, nine inches in diameter for the single-ended. And that was uh, 20 feet for the double-ended. Number of tubes. For the double-ended is 860, and for the single-ended is 430. Number of stray tubes for the double-ended, 284, as the single-ended, 142. And the outside diameter of tubes for the double-ended was 2 and 3 quarter inches, 
Um, and that was for the double-ended and for the single-ended was two and three-quarter inches, so the same. Number of furnaces for the double-ended was six and the single-ended was three. And then the information will be shared by both double-ended and single-ended. The number of the length of the fire bars, uh, the number of furnaces, excuse me, total was 159. Length of the fire bars was five feet, nine inches. Heating surface total, 144,100, let's see. Yes, 144,142 square feet. The great surface area total was 3,466 square feet. The weight of the boiler for the double-ended is 91 and a half tons, and for the single-ended was 57 and three-quarter tons. The weight of water in each boiler for the double-ended boiler was 40, or was four, let's see, 48 and a half tons. And for the single-ended, it was 29 tons. Total weight of water in the boilers was 1,309 tons, and that's for both open and single-ended, double-ended. Working boiler pressure, PSIG for the double-ended is 215, as well, the single-ended was 215. As well as the test pressure, PSIG for both boilers was 430. And again, unfortunately, we do not have pictures from Titanic's engine room. But I'll show you these engines that were similar. The aft, the after end of Olympic starboard engine in the erecting shop. after end of the port engine, the after end of the Titanic's port engine in the erecting shop. Engine bed plates. The bed plates and crank subassemblies being transported to Britannic from the shops in Holland and Wolf. The cylinder, order, and crank sequence. The arrangement of cylinders and angle, the national sequence of cranks. The notation, excuse me. And check that out. The cylinder support column. Outboard support column belonging to the forward LP cylinder of Britannic's port engine. Here, after trial fitting and assembly, the engines are being partially dismantled for transport to the fitting out wharf, Holland and Wolf. In the port intermediate cylinder casing, the completed casting prior to machining, and look at the size of that. Crankshaft and the lathe, a segment of one of Olympic's crankshaft, crankshafts in the lathe. Now, these things are massive. And the illustration shows the principal components of a connecting rod assembly. And the upper platform Engine room upper platform from the SS Av Avon. This photo of the platform of the level of the cylinder covers aboard the RMSP company's SS Avon from 1907 gives a good general impression of how the upper levels of Titanic's reciprocating engine room appeared. Note the builder's plaque on the ventilation uh, trunking. Typically, the builder of the machinery, even when it was at the shipbuilder themselves, always installed a plaque on the machinery. The plaque on Titanic's forward deck house at B-Deck wasn't the only one fitted aboard ship. And the detailed illustration of a turning engine is fitted to the main reciprocating engines. And let's see, we'll take a look at the engine room starting platform from the SS New Amsterdam. 
And then we have the turbine being fitted aboard ship. That's for the Britannic, by the way. And the reciprocating engines being fitted aboard ship, the Britannic. And we've got the wooden patterns for the turbine casings. And this is the Britannic rotator in the lathe. And a wooden platform, the patterns for the turbine casing. And that's for the Olympic. And we got the turbine rotator in the lathe for Olympic. And a turbine case casting. Again, for the Olympic. So unfortunately, we don't really have a lot of inside Titanic engine room pictures. Um, we got the turbine case being machined. And again, that's for the Olympic. And the turbine case itself. And this is for the Britannic. And the turbine case casting. And that's Britannic. And a lower turbine case for Britannic. And on this, let's see, this is the turbine case casting, the completed casting for the lower forward of Britannic's turbine casing. And the rotator in process of blading for the turbine. And the detail of the blading. The test fitter, the rotor, and it's test fitting. Test fitting Britannic's turbine rotor, in this case, the four large pillar-like gu guide pins rising from the lower case have been temporarily installed to help accurately guide the upper case while the overhead cranes lower it into position. Holland and Wolf. So reversing engine and main engine controls at the starting platform level. Port engine of Britannic pictured, except as indicated, the starboard engine had an identical independent set of controls. And I'll show you the picture and I'll go through the, uh, the letters for you guys. A is the reversing engines. B is the main stop valve hand wheel. C is the bypass valve hand wheel. Uh, D, reversing lever, and this is shown in the astern position. E is the turbine changeover valve lever. F is the turbine starting valve. Port station only. Um, the port station only used to moment, moment, momentarily inject high pressure steam to assist in bringing the turbine up to speed. G is the LP and IP cylinder starting valve levers. H is the HP and forward LP cylinders drain levers for draining off condensed warming steam prior to starting. I is the engine revolution counter. And J is the emergency stop valve lever. So that's just a little bit of information on the engines and the turbines and the boilers. Again, sadly, there's nothing from Titanic itself, only the, um, the facsimile from Britannic and Olympic, which were very close, but they weren't identical to Titanic. And I could go on and this could be a six hour video, and I would love that, but um, in order to keep everything s simple and not that long, um, it goes into the propellers, and you can see that the um, turbine has the four blades in the middle, and again, that's gonna be a whole different um, video. But I wanted to share some of the engine facts with you guys, the boilers from Titanic, the ship Magnificent. This is a fantastic Titanic book series. And it's a little pricey, but in my opinion, it was well worth it. 
um, a vast knowledge. Just about everything you could possibly think of when it comes to Titanic is listed in here. So my friends, I just wanted to give you a little bit, a little taste of the engines, the boilers, and the turbine, and different things when it comes to the Titanic's engine room. So my friends, until my next video about the beloved RMS Titanic, thank you so much for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.